Our story tonight will take us on the waves of the Atlantic Ocean and on some of the largest passenger ships ever built, ocean liners. We will relieve the competition between lines and ships to be the fastest, the largest, the fanciest. I'll tell you about the experience of European migrants traveling to America, of wealthy tourists and businessmen crossing the ocean on these floating palaces. And we will relieve the stories of some of the most famous liners from the 20th century, like the Titanic and its sister ship, the Olympic, the Queen Mary, the SS Normandy, the SS United States, the Bremen, the Rex. So let's begin right now with arguably the most famous of them all, even though it is for tragic reasons, the Titanic. I'm not going to retell the night of the sinking, because you know the story. And it is spectacular, but also sad. And also it could suggest that crossing the Atlantic in the 20th century on liners was something dangerous, when in reality it wasn't, at least during peacetime. Another large liner sunk a few years later, the Lusitania, during the First World War after it was attacked by submarines. But the disaster of the Titanic is only one of two big accidents that happened over thousands and thousands of crossings. The other one was a collision two years later, in 1914, between another liner, the Empress of Ireland, and a cargo ship in the mouth of the St. Lawrence River in Canada. Other than that, liners were actually very safe, statistically. And, ironically, safety was one of the perceived advantages of the Titanic. This ship was not the first liner of its kind to be launched. She had a big sister, the Olympic, and the Olympic was already in operations when the Titanic made its first and last voyage. A third one, called the Britannic, was also commissioned. This family of ships is very telling about transatlantic travel at the beginning of the 20th century. The Olympic was launched in 1911 and the Titanic in 1912. They were owned and operated by a British shipping company, the White Star Line, which comprised almost 30 ships in 1912. In the run-up to the First World War, traffic in the Atlantic, essentially between the USA and Western Europe, was growing fast, and both ways. There were still migrants from European countries going to America, but with the development of tourism and economic connections between the two continents, a lot of travelers went to the other side to visit or on business trips. We'll discuss it in more details when I tell you about the history of liners. This new clientele was sought after because these were wealthy travelers, industrialists, bankers, politicians, heirs and their families. 70 to 80 percent of them were Americans who went to Europe to visit the old continent, to meet their relatives and stay for a few weeks or months before going back home. They had money to spend, and they wanted to enjoy the trip. It had to go fast, about a week at the beginning of the 20th century. 
So shipping lines tried to attract them with new ships that were spectacular, luxurious, safe and fast. Until the First World War, the market was dominated by British lines like White Star and Cunard, but increasingly they had to compete with German lines like Hamburg America or Norddeutsche Lloyd. White Star launched an ambitious project to replace its older liners, which dated from the previous century, with ships that would be larger and more comfortable than any other before. And this is why the Olympic class that included the Titanic was designed. They had to be more attractive than all older liners, larger, and they had to embody the kind of European luxury that wealthy Americans looked for, because in first class they would be the majority of clients. The competition to offer larger, faster and fancier ships had begun earlier, in particular in the first decade of the century. The main British competitor, Cunard, had launched two liners, the Lusitania and the Mauritania, that were on top of this game. But the Olympic and the Titanic were designed to outdo them. So the project was started in 1907 and uh, the two ships were built in Belfast, in Northern Ireland. There were slight differences introduced to make construction a bit more economical or to improve performance, but overall the three ships, Olympic, Titanic and Britannic, looked very similar. Titanic was almost 900 feet long, that's about 270 meters, and her height above the waterline was 92 feet or 28 meters, that is to say about a 10-story building. She had 10 decks, 10 floors, 8 of which were for passenger use. And from top to bottom, the highest one was the boat deck, on which the lifeboats were housed. This sounds like an impractical choice. Why not have the lifeboats closer to the water? But it is because the ship needed to maneuver while docking, so the lifeboats had to be placed high above the platforms where passengers would embark and disembark. The decks reflected the hierarchy of classes. First class cabins and restaurants, entrances, lounges, smoking rooms, libraries, promenades dedicated to first class passengers were on the four top decks, which also included a few amenities for second-class travelers. But it was all separated, so that passengers of different classes would never mix. The one deck where passengers could be a bit closer to one another, but still separated, was the fifth one. It had dining saloons for first and second class passengers and a space accessible to third class passengers. And then, still going down to the bottom, the sixth to eighth decks had cabins for second and third class. Every passenger was located above the waterline. Below it, there were two more decks for cargo space and at the very bottom, on the 10th deck, the inner bottom of the hull, a platform for the ship's boilers, engines, turbines and electrical generators. Passengers could obviously not access these. But given the size of the ship, the inside was a maze of stairs between decks, of separations between classes, of long corridors that gave access to cabins and plenty of other rooms, kitchens, cabins for the crew, a swimming pool, Turkish bath, 
kennels for animals, a squash court, a post office. There were communication systems between the bridge, on top of the ship from where it was piloted, and the engine rooms at the very bottom. The complexity of this liner was unequalled because of its size. It could carry 3,300 people at once, 2,400 passengers, and 900 crew. Due to slightly different design choices, the Titanic was marginally larger than the Olympic, and so when she was launched, it was the largest ocean liner in the world. It was an event, but not such an extraordinary novelty, because its sister ship had been in operation for months when the Titanic made its first crossing. But for passengers, this was still an extraordinary experience. Even first-class passengers did not do that kind of travel so often. And they knew that they would travel on one of the most spectacular machines ever built by man. Like a floating town, propelled by giant engines that only battleships could compete with. And a lot of thought had gone into the ship's design to maximize their comfort. For example, there were two kinds of engines on the Titanic. There was one turbine and two reciprocating engines, all powered by steam. Turbines provided more power, but they caused uncomfortable vibrations. And this was a conception problem that the big liners owned by Cunard had encountered, the Lusitania and the Mauretania. So in order to provide a smoother experience, the Titanic was equipped with only one turbine, the main engine that provided 40% of its power, and two slightly less powerful but more comfortable reciprocating engines. Each of them drove a propeller, so there were three propellers, and their combined power was expected to make the ships of this class some of the fastest, if not the fastest, on the Atlantic. The proportions of the engines were really impressive. Modern engines tend to be smaller than that, whereas these steam-powered engines required huge space and quantities of coal. The reciprocating engines were 63 feet long, that's 19 meters, and they weighed more than 700 tons each. In the lower deck of the ship, there were 29 boilers to produce steam, and 159 furnaces to heat them. Each boiler could contain 48 tons of water, the equivalent to a small swimming pool. To power all this, 600 tons of coal were required each day, and they had to be shoveled into furnaces by hand. So just making the engines work required the service of almost 200 firemen who worked around the clock feeding the furnaces with coal. This produced 100 tons of ashes every day. So, 30 to 40 meters under the feet of first-class passengers who were enjoying their journey in luminous and luxurious lounges or the comfort of their cabins, there was a totally different world of heat, metal and dirt, where hundreds of mechanics and firemen worked relentlessly to keep the floating palace moving. And the liner was illuminated with electricity, too. Thousands of light bulbs. At the time, in 1912, electricity for lighting and other uses, like communication, was not uncommon. Many American and European towns already had electrical plants. But still, for many passengers, the abandons of artificial light was the first time they had seen anything like that in their lives. 
oil or gas lamps were more common than electricity still. The electrical plant on the Titanic produced more power than an average city power station at the time. The ship also had auxiliary generators in the stern of the ship. After it hit the iceberg and started to sink, these secondary generators were activated and this is why the ship stayed illuminated until the last few minutes before it sank. For additional security, the interiors of the ships of the Olympic class were subdivided into different compartments. There were 16 of them, and they could be sealed with watertight doors. The idea was that should one compartment be filled with water, it could still be isolated and not compromise the whole ship. This type of design works well for large ships, but it was still not enough to save the Titanic because the bridge to its hull was too long beyond salvage. The liner also had four funnels, these big chimneys that all liners had. These funnels served for practical reasons, to evacuate smoke high enough to not incommodate the passengers on the upper decks. But they also had an aesthetical purpose. They gave the liners a particular line, a silhouette, a visual signature. Actually, of the four funnels of the Titanic, only three were functional. The fourth one was mostly decorative. It only served to evacuate air from the kitchens. It was very oversized for that purpose. This visual signature of liners with high funnels, this lasted well after the age of coal, when liquid fuel replaced it. High chimneys were less necessary. There were still gases to expel, but no longer the kind of thick black smoke that comes from coal burning. But liners along the 20th century kept funnels because they were expected from them. They placed the ships in the prestigious lineage of previous transatlantic ships. They have disappeared on modern cruise ships mostly, which are the successors to these ocean liners, and we'll talk about this transition later. But for now, let's see what existed before the Titanic and the evolution of transatlantic journeys over time. Let's talk about history. As we are about to explore the decades before the Titanic, take this moment to adopt a comfortable position. If it is time to sleep, enjoy the comfort of your bed. And think about all the tension that may prevent you from getting rest. Maybe there is tension in your shoulders and your neck. If this is the case, just release it gently. You can also scan the rest of your body for tension, all the way to your fingers and your toes. As always, there are timestamps all along this video, and in the first comment, pinned under it to help you navigate the story and go to the parts you wish to listen to or resume it another time if you fall asleep. Together with the timestamps you will find a link to my profiles on audio streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon or Deezer and many more. If you prefer stories without sound effects or music at the beginning and after, voice only, this is the place to go. There is a clear majority of you who like these sounds, so they are here to stay on YouTube. But you have these alternatives available if you don't like the sounds too much, or if you'd rather listen with your screen turned off. 
and yet another alternative, but it is not free, is my Patreon page, where all the stories are posted as podcasts, voice only, or with sound effects all along. If you wish to join my Patreon, you can also download everything. The library has about 90 stories available for download at this point, and I post there about upcoming videos and what I'm working on. There is also a link to Patreon in the description and the pinned comment. And now, let's return to Ocean Liners and explore the uh, appearance of these giants of the seas. What was it like to travel between Europe and America several centuries ago? Of course, until the 19th century, all travels were made on sailing boats, and even though there was a flow of migrants in the 17th and 18th centuries, Passenger traffic was not yet very intense. For most migrants, it was a one-way trip to America. The only people who made the drone trip who came back were soldiers, troops sent to the colonies and back, and a few administrators, explorers or traders. There were small convoys of settlers on ships that either stayed in America or returned almost empty of passengers. This wasn't enough to establish commercial lines, and individual travelers would pay for their crossing on merchant ships. It was dangerous. Piracy in the Atlantic Ocean was a reality until the late 17th century. Ships could get lost, in storms, and you could never precisely know when you would reach your destination. This started to change 200 years ago, for a plurality of reasons. The United States and other countries in America had become independent, and they were growing very fast, demographically and economically. Emigration from Europe to America reached another level. From tens of thousands annually, it became hundreds of thousands along the 19th century. So the flow of potential passengers was growing exponentially. Then the colonial powers in Europe, especially Great Britain, needed to put in place stable maritime routes to connect the different parts of their empires around the world. Until the 19th century, there was no accepted regulation of navigation. Each country did what they wanted or what they could. New concepts like international waters were put in place. A lot of international norms started in this period. For example, maybe you wondered what is the meaning of these letters, these prefixes, in front of ships' names, like RMS, SS. Liners generally come with the letters SS, a prefix that means screw steamer. It is sometimes also translated as steamship, even though it is not 100% accurate because initially there were two prefixes for steamships, SS for screw steamer and PS for paddle steamer. But paddle steamers almost entirely disappeared, so only SS remained. Now the letters RMS that a lot of British liners used, RMS Titanic, RMS Olympic, RMS Queen Mary, they mean Royal Mail Service. This prefix means that they carried mail and a contract to the British Royal Mail. Many ship lines like White Star, Cunard, Piano liked to use this prefix because it was prestigious and it suggested efficiency and uh, punctuality. <laughs> 
The use of these prefixes for civilian ships has become less visible nowadays, and there are no longer SS, because even though large ships are still propelled with screws, they typically have internal combustion engines, not steam. And there is a prefix for that, MV, motor vessel, but it is rarely used. So, returning to our story, as the governments wanted to have stable communication lines with their possessions or other countries around the world, they started to encourage the creation of passenger services. The first one on the Atlantic, between England and the US, was established in 1818. It was called the Black Ball Line, and it connected Liverpool to New York City with medium-sized boats that could at the same time travel on the ocean and in rivers. This first line was founded by a group of New York Quaker merchants and it kept operating for 60 years. But sailing on the Atlantic was still rather slow and uncertain, even though most journeys ended well. The big change was due to the replacement of sails with steam engines. The very first ship working with a steam engine was built in 1807 during Napoleonic Wars. It was slow and could only be used on short distances. Its maiden voyage was on the Hudson River between New York City and Albany, but it worked well enough to establish a regular service between the two cities. In 1816, the first crossing of the English Channel by a steamship was achieved and a regular service was put in place between France and England. And a few years later, in 1819, the Atlantic was crossed for the first time by a steamship, the SS Savannah, that went from Savannah to Liverpool in 27 days. It was less impressive than it sounds, because the ship also had sails, and the steam engine was only used for four days out of 27. But still, the viability of a steamship on a large ocean was established. The problem with steam engines at the time was that they were way less efficient than they would become. They consumed too much coal for a direct crossing because only a fraction of the power they produced could be put to use. Their efficiency was still very low. And another problem at the start was that there was no public enthusiasm for this technology. The idea of traveling with a boiler under pressure under your feet on an experimental ship was really unattractive. These ships were still made of wood mainly, and the thought of a boiler explosion was not reassuring. In fact, the SS Savannah was attracting no one. On the day of departure, 32 people had booked a seat and no one showed up. So its steam engine was removed and it operated with sails for the rest of its career. It sounds a bit silly now. But at the time, public opinion and even writers who influenced it were very skeptical that a steamship would ever be able to cross an ocean using a steam engine all the way. Because the quantity of coal looked way too much for the ship to be able to transport its own fuel. But this was without taking into account technical improvements. New engines were designed that were more and more efficient in using steam and with condensers which fed the boilers with fresh water that was reused. That was a useful innovation 
because when water from the sea was used, it left salt in the boilers and they had to be regularly shut down and cleaned up to remove it. In 1837, the first long distance travel using steam power all along was achieved on a journey from Liverpool to New York City. The first time it took 18 days already a huge improvement over sailing ships that needed about a month. But they had miscalculated the quantity of coal for the crossing and the crew had to burn cabin furniture to complete the voyage and establish this record. But from this moment on, the competition to cross the Atlantic as fast as possible began and the tradition appeared the Blue Riband. It was an unofficial recognition, an accolade, attributed to the fastest boat to cross the Atlantic. And the Blue Riband was not based on how long the crossing took, but the average speed, because there were different routes. The Blue Riband changed hands many times. It was British, American, French, German, Italian. And the last holder of the title, who technically is still the holder, because no other new liners competed for it, is the SS United States that was launched at the beginning of the 1950s. An important figure in the development of large steamships in the 19th century was an English engineer called Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He is credited with a lot of inventions and technical improvements at the time of the Industrial Revolution, especially in railways, but he also worked on ships, and he realized that with the arrival of steam technology, it made sense, technically and financially, to build bigger and bigger boats because the carrying capacity of a ship increases as the cube of its dimensions. If you double its length, its height and its width, you multiply its capacity, its volume, by eight, it makes sense. But at the same time, the water resistance only increases as the square of its dimensions. And water resistance is what you have to overcome to make the ship move. So this means that, tendentially, the larger the ship, the more fuel-efficient it can be. It didn't matter that much when ships were powered by wind, which is free, but coal or any other fossil fuel is not, and has to be stored. So the logical consequence of this was that large ships should be more efficient and more profitable that is the strong rationale behind the creation of larger and larger liners during the age of steam. It is not just that they were more comfortable, because they could offer more space and services to the passengers, or that they were appealing because of their extraordinary size. They were also more efficient as passenger services across the Atlantic were put in place and fully booked on their journey from Europe to America because of the rise in migration, technical innovations continued. Paddle wheels on the first ships were replaced by propellers. Paddle wheels worked well on still waters, but on an ocean with waves, a propeller is more efficient or several, to propel bigger and bigger ships. The hulls changed too. They transitioned from wood to metal, so they could carry the heavier and heavier machinery required. The race to gigantic boats had begun and would eventually lead up to the Titanic in 1912, or even bigger, the SS Imperator in 1913, a German liner even bigger 
that had a capacity of 4,000 passengers. Before them, other milestones were the SS Great Eastern in 1858, another ship designed by Brunel. It remained the largest passenger ship in the world for more than 40 years, until the 1890s and it could carry 4,000 passengers between England and Australia. The ship did not operate between Europe and America, so technically it was not a transatlantic liner. It had a complicated career, including an explosion during its maiden voyage, but it could reach Australia from England without stopping, with a combination of steam and wind propulsion. In the second half of the 19th century and the 1900s, competition on transatlantic routes raged between two main British lines, White Star, the owner of the Titanic, as we have seen before, and Cunard. There were also other competitors, the Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, better known as the French Line, and uh, several German lines that established services between uh, Hamburg or Bremen and America. They all tried to outdo the competition with uh, faster, bigger and more comfortable ships. And on all these aspects, new ships established new records. They were now entirely made of metal and the last auxiliary sails were disappearing in favor of full steam propulsion. For example, in 1870, the White Star launched the RMS Oceanic, which offered electricity, large portholes, and running water to all its first-class passengers. In 1897, a German line, Norddeutscher Lloyd, launched the SS Kaiser Wilhelm der Große, which combined all the luxuries existing on other ships, plus engines that were powerful enough to steal the blue ribbon from the British ships that had retained it until this year. This liner was also the first one to have four funnels, even though it really needed only two, but more were added for aesthetics and to give passengers a feeling of safety and power. To stay in the competition, other lines did the same, and incorporated four funnels to their designs. For ten years, the blue ribbon remained in German hands, and it had become maybe too important at the expense of passenger comfort. Another liner the SS Deutschland, designed to obtain the blue ribbon, did so with engines that generated very strong vibrations, to the point of incommodating people on board. But the British kept responding, and they took back the accolade with new ships like the Lusitania and the Mauretania, launched by Cunard, and a few years later, the Olympic class by White Star. At the same time, the French line introduced in 1912 another four funnels and four propellers liner that was not the largest, not the fastest, but the fanciest, the SS France. And it was a commercial success, it became one of the most sought after liners by the French and American public for the quality of food an interior decoration that reminded of the Palace of Versailles. The Germans were preparing their response to the last giant British liners, including the SS Imperator that I mentioned before, when the First World War started in 1914 and strongly disturbed transatlantic travel. Passenger traffic dropped the blockers of Germany was put in place, and with front lines all over Europe, American tourism vanished. <laughs>
Some of the liners were converted temporarily into hospital ships, like the Mauritania or the Britannic, the third ship of the Olympic class. Others became troop transports or were converted to warships, even though they didn't have the kind of armor necessary to engage in battles against battleships or cruisers. The liners were privately owned, but they were seized or rented by the government economically during the war due to the necessity of coordinating the war effort. The states became very interventionist, especially in Great Britain and in France, as opposed to their previous approach that stayed away of the private sector. It didn't really come as a surprise to anyone because in the years before the war, shipbuilders worked at the same time for shipping companies and for the military, and plans had been made to use the entire national fleet in case of a conflict to participate in the war effort. During the war, many liners were lost. The Britannic, the younger sister of the Titanic, sank in the Aegean Sea after she struck a mine. The Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse was defeated and scuttled after a battle off the coast of West Africa. But the most famous accident remains the torpedoing and sinking of the RMS Lusitania by German submarines in 1915. At the time, the Lusitania was still operating as a passenger ship. In theory, civilian passenger ships were supposed to be spared, but Germany was starting a policy of unrestricted warfare, and the sinking caused the death of more than a hundred Americans, even though the USA had stayed neutral in the war. The news caused a lot of emotion in America, where at the time the public opinion was strongly against intervention in the war and in favor of neutrality. The sinking strongly pushed the US in favor of Great Britain and France. The country only entered the war in 1917 on the side of the Allies, but before that it had already started to support them with funding and the sale of equipment. When the war ended, all large German liners that could still function were seized as war reparations and they were operated by Allied powers. The First World War had completely changed the face of the world. European powers had started it wealthy and confident. They were the bankers of the world, they had colonies on every continent, and four years later they were indebted, they had lost millions of men, and the seeds of independence in their colonies overseas had appeared, so nothing would ever be the same again. In the East, the empire of the Xars had fallen to communism, and the USA was stronger than ever, but very hesitant, very reluctant to intervene. A new world was appearing, and in the 1920s, a period of economic euphoria following the devastation of the war was beginning. In this interwar period, the 1920s and 30s, a new age began for transatlantic liners, and with it came a new generation of ships that would push the limits, not only technical limits, but in terms of luxury, service, and even size. Now that the conflict was over, shipping companies could resume their operations, but the economic aspect of transatlantic passenger lines had drastically changed. First, the period of mass emigration to America was now really over. The decline had started before the First World War, 
when the USA had started to restrict new entrances, but in the 1920s and 30s, the flows of migrants became very limited. The US restricted again their quotas of migrants drastically, and this source of income for lines vanished. But Europe lacked arms to work in its industry anyway, and European countries wanted to restore their demography. There were still travelers, as business and leisure travel quickly returned to their pre-war level. But a problem that arose was that given the competition and the expected level of service on ships, it had become very hard, if not impossible, to turn a profit in this industry. For reasons of prestige, and due to the externalities of having large liners, European governments still wanted to have passenger lines to America, and large, impressive ships. By externalities, I mean spending by travelers that benefited the whole national economy, the jobs created or maintained, the know-how of shipyards, and the necessity to give them work, to preserve a national naval capacity that was also useful for military reasons. So the government started to give subsidies to passenger lines and uh, help fund new ships. They all had to do it to stay in the race, because otherwise the age of large liners, or at least the age of first-class travel, would have ended due to the lack of a profitable model. So in this new age of liners, competition between countries for prestige and to show their national genius and engineering capabilities tended to replace the competition between shipping lines that prevailed before. Even though, of course, there was already an element of national pride in ocean liners before 1914. So with the interwar period, came a new generation of liners, like the British Queen Mary, the French Normandie, the German Bremen, or the Italian Rex. In this particular period, American lines had a hard time competing, because the US government was less inclined to give subsidies, but also the US shot themselves in the foot when it came to transatlantic travel due to prohibition. U.S. liners were considered to be an extension of U.S. territory, so the prohibition of alcohol extended to them, and it cost a big chunk of the transatlantic market. Among prominent modern liners of the 1920s and 1930s, two were French. The Ile de France, launched in 1927, and even more, the Normandie in 1935. The Ile de France was the first major ocean liner built after the First World War. Some that had been started or operated before the war, like the Mauritania, remained in service in the 1920s. But it was the first time that a new liner appeared on the market. The age of the race to ever bigger ships was mostly over for now, and the Ile de France had three funnels instead of four. Its tonnage was 20% less than the Titanic, and it could receive 1,800 passengers only, far from the 4,000 that the last pre-war giants like the German Imperator could carry. But the Ile de France was a commercial success for the image it developed. It was modern in its decoration. Pre-war liners, or liners in the early 20s, still had the kind of decoration that existed on the Lusitania or the Titanic, a Victorian or Beaux-Arts style. That is to say, a mix of all the styles neoclassical, neo-baroque, neo-gothic, with designs that reminded of the antiquity and styles of the 18th century. 
heavy sculptures, curved stairs. It was a translation of the uh, interior decoration of 19th century mansions and bourgeois apartments that existed in Western European or American cities. The Ile de France had embraced the new fashionable style, Art Deco, or modern style, which was still rather ornamented, but with straight lines, geometry, new decorative patterns inspired by geometry or ethnic patterns. This looked fresh and unique, something that wealthy and hip travelers wanted. Add to this that for American travelers, they had the choice between American liners looking a bit old-fashioned and with no alcohol, or a new and trendy ship where they could party and travel with celebrities. Because the ship developed a reputation for being entertaining and glamorous, in the 20s and 30s, many more international celebrities like movie stars, singers, musicians, performers appeared. They traveled both ways on the Atlantic. There were European movie stars in Hollywood like Marlene Dietrich or Greta Garbo. There were American jazz musicians or performers who went to Europe, like Josephine Baker. And more than other ships, the Ile de France embodied the festive and happy atmosphere of the 1920s, at least for the kind of wealthy elite that could afford traveling on it. Given its success and the will to impose a new gigantic and impressive liner, on Atlantic routes, the French line developed a new, more ambitious project, the SS Normandie. The Normandie made its maiden voyage in 1935 and was a commercial failure for reasons I will tell you about. Launching in the middle of the Great Depression obviously didn't help, but it is still one of the most impressive liners ever built for its combination of performance and style. When the Normandy made its first crossing in 1935, it was the largest and fastest passenger ship afloat in the world. It could cross the Atlantic in a bit more than four days. You remember that sailboats needed a good month the first steamships needed two weeks. At the time of the Titanic, it had dropped further to less than a week, and now four days. The age of coal was over for large ships, and the Normandy had turboelectric engines. She was still a steamship, but steam produced by burning fuel oil, not coal. This is why it is still the SS Normandy screw steamer. It is not that her propulsion was incredibly powerful, but her hull had been drawn to be particularly efficient, and her line was also very modern, giving hints at the transition of liners towards modern cruise ships that would happen many years later. And thanks to her modernity, she could capture the blue riband, but what she remained also famous for was her interior design and decoration. She was very spacious for passengers. The Normandy was 20% longer and heavier than the Titanic, but for less passengers, only 2,000. And she had the most lavish and expensive interiors ever made all in Art Deco style, featuring contemporary French artists. The interiors were filled with grand perspectives, high roofs, big entryways and long, wide staircases. It was very theatrical. The main dining room felt like a cathedral. The funnel uptakes had been split to pass along the sides of the ship. 
rather than straight upwards. So that left a lot of volume for interior rooms. The first class dining hall was 300 feet long, 46 feet wide and 28 feet high. The room could seat 700 people and passengers entered through 20 foot tall doors adorned with bronze medallions. Many first class cabins were actually more like suites. The most luxurious ones had private dining rooms, multiple bedrooms, a piano, a private deck. The list goes on and on. It was a grandiose ship, maybe too much for its own good. It made the Normandy very expensive to operate. Its construction took longer than expected, and for travelers, the lavish and impressive, bigger-than-life interiors made it a curiosity worth seeing, but not necessarily a place where you want to stay. She was maybe too spectacular and intimidating to be fun and enjoyable. This liner probably reached the limit of the ever more luxury logic that had started in the 19th century. And this contributed to its commercial failure, of course combined with the Great Depression. When she started operating in 1935, the worst of the Depression was over and the world economy had begun to stabilize. But the mood was no longer to something so eccentric and ostentatious. The Normandy was structurally making losses and could only operate with subsidies to uh, even the accounts. But the performance was here, technically. It battled with the Queen Mary for the Blue Riband, and uh, each ship took it alternatively in the run-up to the Second World War. In the war, the Normandy was in New York City, and it was seized by US authorities. In 1942, the liner was being converted to a troop ship when she caught fire and capsized. She came to rest on the mud of the Hudson River. The interiors were lost to flames or water. She was salvaged, but it appeared after the war that restoration would be too costly. So the ship was scrapped in 1946. In the same period, late 20s and 30s, other European countries launched their new generation liners too. In 1928, the Norddeutscher Line from Germany launched the SS Bremen and her sister ship, the SS Europa. The Bremen had her maiden voyage in July 1929 they couldn't know it, but obviously not the best timing, three months before the Black Thursday when Wall Street collapsed and a crisis that would become the Great Depression started. Six years before the Normandy, the Bremen was the most advanced liner with high-speed steam turbines, that is to say steel steam propulsion, not a combustion engine, but powered with fuel oil. The Bremen was a return to heavy liners. She had the same tonnage as the Titanic, and it would be overtaken only several years later by the Normandy and then the Queen Mary. When they began operations, the ship was the most modern technically, and the Bremen easily captured the Blue Riband. She also had a luxurious first class and introduced a fourth class, the tourist class, between second and third in terms of price and space. She also had for the first time a small seaplane that could be catapulted from the ship with mail and land hours before the ship reached its destination. This was a way of accelerating mail delivery. To give you an idea about fuel consumption, she needed 33 tons of fuel per hour, about a small bathtub every minute. 
But with that, she could propel 3,000 people, 2,000 passengers and 1,000 crew at a speed of 27 knots, that's about 50 km per hour. For Germany, after the defeat in the First World War and the huge economic trouble in the 1920s, this was a symbol of industrial comeback and the construction of the Bremen sparked new competition which pushed France to launch the Normandy and the UK the Queen Mary. But there was yet another country willing to enter the competition, Italy. Since 1922, Mussolini controlled the country and wanted to show off the capabilities of Italian industry and engineering. So a lot of care went into the design of another liner about the size of the Bremen, the SS Rex. She launched in 1931 and made her first voyage in 1932. At first there were big technical difficulties and the maiden voyage was a bit disastrous. The engines stopped working when the ship was approaching Gibraltar and they even lost their electrical supply. But after repairs and improvements, the ship finally lived up to its promises and captured the Blue Riband, which it kept from 1933 to 1935. The Rex was another impressive floating palace with eccentric features. She had a classical decoration, which could look a bit dated, but that still had a, a public. But apart from that, she was themed as the floating Riviera. For example, sand was scattered in the outdoor swimming pools and they were surrounded with multicolored umbrellas to give them a beach-like effect. The Rex operated until Italy entered the Second World War and she was sunk in bombing operations in 1944. And finally, there was yet another major and famous British ship that made its maiden voyage in 1936, the RMS Queen Mary. The two main British operators of liners, White Star and Cunard, went into big financial trouble in the 1930s and they couldn't finish the ships they had under construction. So, under supervision and with the help of the government, they were merged into a single company, Cunard White Star. The new line could complete and start operating its new flagship, the Queen Mary, in 1936. She was followed by a sister ship, the Queen Elizabeth, a bit larger, in 1938. They were a response to recent superliners like the Bremen, Normandy and Rex. The design was criticized at the time for being rather conservative. Her line reminded of pre-war liners and her interior decoration had been modernized to Art Deco, which was now the new fashion, but it looked restrained in comparison with the French liner. It was less over the top but it turned out to be a better commercial strategy because she was more affordable, not that intimidating. In a context of economic depression, she was more sellable and she proved more popular with passengers, which is why the Queen Mary had a quite good career. She was in operation as a liner from 1936 to 1940, then converted to a troop ship during the Second World War to transport soldiers and she returned to commercial service after the war until the 1960s. She took the Blue Riband in 1936, lost it to the Normandy in 1937 but took it back the following year and kept it for 14 years until the SS United States captured it in 1952. The Queen Mary still exists, 
After her last voyage, in 1967, she sailed to California, to Long Beach, and has remained moored there since then, as a tourist attraction with restaurants, a museum, and a hotel. Again, with the arrival of war, transatlantic passenger lines were interrupted, and this time, Warfare in the Atlantic remained ferocious for several years. When it resumed, after 1945, the world had changed again. And it appeared that even though liners were now faster than ever, they could cross the Atlantic in three to four days, their last days of domination on transatlantic travel were nearing. Turbojets that could connect Europe and America in a matter of hours multiplied in the 1950s. There was no way liners could compete with their speed and lower costs. But there would still be new liners launched on this declining market, like the SS France, the RMS Queen Elizabeth II, and the SS United States. The SS United States was probably the best liner constructed in the US, and the fastest of them all. It took the blue ribbon on its maiden voyage, and uh, still holds it today. She could be transformed into a troop ship for 15,000 troops, and that is part of the reason why she was constructed. The US Navy participated in its funding because she could turn into a strategic asset if need be. She made 400 crossings from 1952 to 1969. But like competitors, she could just not turn a profit in the 1960s, and this is why she was finally retired. This ship also keeps existing. She is currently in Philadelphia, and has been waiting for a possible transformation or renovation for 50 years. Another one of the last liners was the SS France, which was launched in 1960. Also a national project made more for prestige and possible externalities than direct profitability. The ship was subsidized for its entire career. It was more than a thousand feet long and was an attempt to re-edit the achievement of the Normandy, but with an offer better suited to the market and the times. There were only two classes. First class, which represented 25% of cabins only, and tourists, the rest. The France already announced the transition of liners to cruise ships. What is the difference between the two? Technically, they all are big passenger ships. But an ocean liner is primarily designed to transport passengers from point A to point B. The cruise ship is built for the purpose of taking passengers on a journey. They are pure tourism ships, and even though the journey may include visits outside the ship, the ship is the attraction itself. And that means a different design. Cruise ships need to offer a lot of entertainment, from rooms for shows to clubs, casinos, stores. A liner could always be turned into a cruise ship, but its original design could limit it in its capacity. But still, the France became increasingly a ship people sailed on for the cruise itself, not to go to the other side of the Atlantic and when its losses were amplified by the oil crisis in the 1970s, with the rise in fuel costs, it was sold to a Norwegian cruise company and changed name, it became the Norway. That was a little national tragedy in France at the time, because it symbolized how the times for this kind of national prestige projects were over. As the Norway, she was operated with success as a cruise ship until the 1980s. And since the 1980s, cruise ships have completely overtaken replaced liners. 
the age of these glorious ships that dominated transatlantic routes for a century finally ended. Nowadays, there is one last ocean liner in service in the world, the Queen Mary II. She is in service between Southampton, England, and New York City, but she also doubles as a cruise ship for part of the year, because this market alone would be insufficient. She carries a few thousand people to the other side of the Atlantic, a tiny fraction of passenger traffic between Europe and America, when, at the same time, millions fly to the other side every year. So this is the end of our journey for tonight, and I hope you liked this introduction to ocean liners. I'll talk to you soon with a new story that will take us to space again. But for now, I let you enjoy the sounds of the waves for a little while. Sleep well. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.